Okay, love. Oh. Where is this beautiful picture? Okay. So, um, I guess, well, there's a few people here. I was going to ask whether there's questions about the final. Um, it's basically just like the midterm twice. <laughs> it's, that is, it's, it's like two of the midterms. Um, so, uh, I don't think I have anything new to say about it. Um, but if there's a question, let me know. I have a question, yes. um, which is, uh, there was the, at the beginning, there was the option of writing an essay instead, depending on oh. your grades and all of that sort of stuff. How is that going to work? Now. Oh, you mean because we don't know the grades? Yeah. <laughs> I think if someone's interested in it, let me know. And I, I think it'll probably be okay. I mean, the main reason I had that like requirement is just to let people know that this is writing a, your own paper and, as opposed to doing the take home final is supposed to be our, like a harder, like a more challenging option, right? So, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, we can't use that because we just, we don't know anyone's grade yet. <laughs> so um, just let me know if you're interested and it'll probably be okay. All right. Um, any other questions? And yeah, I'm I'm sorry about the situation with the grades. It's, um, well, you all know what it's due to. So anyway. Um, uh, okay, yeah, and I guess I should say about the the about the option to write the final paper. So there is no assignment for that, right? Uh, that is, there's no prompts or anything. Um, but if you want to do it, and you don't have an idea. Uh, you know, you could talk to me or potentially talk to Carl about, you know, uh, try to come up with something. Um, okay, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Uh, all right, so where we are in the book, and I'm I'm down in the basement here. It's a very weird setup, so you have to bear with me. It's a little bit hard for me to reach various things. Um, okay, so as usual, the doctrine of elements was divided into two parts, transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental logic. And the logic is divided into the analytic, the dialectic, the dialectic was divided into the concepts of pure reason and the dialectical inferences of pure reason. I'm just writing inferences of reason here, but they're dialectical inferences, that is, they're bad inferences. Right, that's what dialectical means, according to Kant. Basically, it means bad, <laughs> like invalid, the dialectical inferences. Um, and um, that is divided into the uh, paralogisms, the antinomy. and the ideal. And the antinomy, as I said last time, it's actually a long session that's divided into all kinds of different parts, right? So like we're only read certain pieces of it, but the, I think they're the key pieces 
or I mean, that is that the key pieces with respect to the third antinomy, because we read the third antinomy itself. And then today we read the critical solution to the third antinomy. Um, so like it's part of a section, section nine of this chapter. It has you have nine sections, or is there even another one after this? I don't remember. But it has a whole bunch of sections, at least nine. <laughs> uh, the, the, the actual antinomies is section two. Section one is like introductory stuff. And then there's all this other stuff. And then there's this section nine. And the title of section nine is actually the empirical employment of the regulative principle of reason in respect of all cosmological ideas. Uh, and it does, like at the beginning, does discuss the regulative use of the ideas, but then it goes into these four subsections, and each one is called uh, critical solution of the cosmological idea of blah, 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 something, right? And they, they're the solutions to the four antinomies. Um, Right, so the reading for today was mostly that, well, I'm not gonna draw this whole structure, but what's stuck in here somewhere is the solution to the third antinomy. And also the first part of the reading was so there's a con there's a concluding note to the math the solutions of the mathematical antinomies. So remember the mathematical categories are quantity and quality, and the dynamical categories are relation and modality. So as we move from the first two antinomies, the antinomy of quality and the quantity, to the second two antinomies the antinomy of cause and effect and the antinomy of contingency of existence. Um, in between, there's this little transition section. So, and I signed that because I think, you know, it contains important information about uh, like how the, what kind of solution the third antinomy is going to have. Um, So first of all, like, what does it even mean to say there's a solution to the antinomy? <laughs> that looks more like it says Boz Mao or something, but it actually says solution. <laughs> so that's, oh, oh, right. <laughs> um, so what does it mean that antinomy has a, solution? Well, I mean, it certainly doesn't mean saying which side is right. Um, uh, right? The point of the antinomies is not that one of the sides is right and that Kant is going to pick the side that's right. I mean, I think that that should be obvious by now, but maybe it's worth emphasizing because I know in the past I've seen like on the uh, final, some students confused about that and thinking that, I mean, Kant does think that one side is good and the other side is bad in some sense, right? Like one side is the side of religion and morality and the other side is against it. But, um, um, or at least like that's what it seems to us. But the truth is that, 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 um, The solution is that the, the that this supposed argument has nothing to do with anything because it's not a good argument, right? So, it, like, it turns out that that what we thought was a difference between the good side and the bad side isn't really important after all. Um, but in any case, like, he certainly doesn't think one is good in the sense of correct. Um, so. Rather, to put it roughly, to find a critical solution to antinomy is to locate the flaw in both sides 
And it should, in some sense, be the same flaw on both sides. Because there's really just one error here. Right? And, and in that respect, the antinomy is not different from the paralogisms and the ideal. Right? It's, it's uh, like, it's not as if here in the antinomy, suddenly there's two mistakes. <laughs> there's still only one mistake, right? And the mistake is to look for an unconditioned ground um, uh, in some series of empirical conditions. Um, Um, so, but it's just, and I tried to explain uh, like somewhat why this is different. Uh, maybe I'll say something like that again today, but you know, then the case of the antinomies that, that error leads you to a contradiction because it, um, um, You end up looking for an unconditioned object uh, where there is a conditioned object, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, so like that's why you're in contradiction with yourself. Um, whereas in the paralogisms and the ideal, the place there is no empirical object in the place where you're looking, so it's okay. I mean, that is, it's not okay. It's still a mistake, but it doesn't yield a contradiction. Um, um, and remember, the the proofs of both sides in the antinomy are basically proofs by contradiction. Right? They don't, like, neither side directly shows that, that what they're arguing for is true. They just show that if you if you assume for sake of argument that the other side is right, you get a contradiction. And that's correct, but it's correct because like the mistaken assumption they both have in common is not self-consistent. So no matter which side you choose, you're gonna get a contradiction. Right. Um so uh so I mean that's about the antinomies and their solutions. In, in general. So the solution is going to somehow consist in like pointing out what, you know, what mistake you made that led to the contradiction and what you should have said instead or something like that. However, the claim in that transitional section is that there's a big difference between the way this happens in the case of the mathematical categories and the way it happens in the case of the dynamical categories. So, um, um, so this is on B557. Didn't write down the Kemp Smith page number here. Hmm. Um, Is that readable? Yeah. Is it in focus? It's readable. All right. This suit in our previous trial of it, that is in the case of the mathematical categories, has been dismissed as resting on both sides on false presuppositions. Um, maybe better without the slides. You might be wrong. Oh wait, because I didn't turn off the light. So better with that.
Evet, ben sevgim oldu ya. Um, but since the dynamical antinomy of presupposition compatible with the pretensions of reason may perhaps be found, and since the judge may perhaps make good what is lacking in the pleas which both sides have been guilty of misstating, the suit may be settled to the satisfaction of both parties. A procedure impossible in the case of the dynamic of the mathematical antinomies. Right? So, I mean, uh, in the judicial in the judicial metaphor, we understand the difference here. Um, you know, in in like so in neither case are we having a verdict for one side or the other, right? Like the judge is not gonna say, Thesis, you were right. Antithesis, you were wrong. But um, but in the mathematic case, the mathematical case, that's going to be because the judge says, uh, you know, you are both arguing on false presuppositions, and so I'm dismissing the case. There isn't going to be any verdict, and that's the solution. Whereas in the dynamical antinomies, the judge is going to say, well, you both stated uh, your your claim based on wrong presuppositions. But I'm going to supply a different presupposition. I, I think that's what it means. I'm actually not even sure. I think that's what he's saying. I'm going to supply a different presupposition. I mean, he certainly says the judge supplies a presupposition. I'm not sure about the first part. Anyway, um, and uh, and thereby I'm going to correct both of your claims. And both of your claims as corrected are going to turn out to be okay. But it's also going to turn out they don't conflict with each other. So now, rather than dismissing the case, I'm going to say, um, uh, you both have the rights that you uh, that you should have been arguing for, something like that. I, I mean, it's hard to imagine this happening in an actual lawsuit. That's what's that's what's kind of stopping me here. Like, how would this actually play out? Uh, but um, well, I don't know. I shouldn't waste time trying to think of that. Um, it's not a waste. Like it's it's actually it's like when a philosopher uses a metaphor. It's in my opinion, it's always worth seeing how far you can push the metaphor, right? So. Uh, um therefore it's always worth giving some thought to the the literal case that it's supposed to be carried over from right that's what metaphor means like carried over <laughs> um the, it's always worth giving some thought to the literal case what is the literal case really like uh is the philosopher assuming the right thing about the literal case etc. But anyway, I don't have a great thing to say about it now, so I'm going to go on. Um, so um, before trying to explain why that there's that difference, um, I'll just, you know, say, uh, give at least a brief version of how it's going to work out in the case of the third antinomy in particular. So in the third antinomy, uh, the answer is going to be, though, though there can't be a free cause in the series of appearances, meaning that it can't appear as such Right? That is, it can't appear as a free cause in the series of appearances. Um, and why am I emphasizing that? Because, because, I mean, so like, that's what we're giving the antithesis. Antithesis you're right, we can't encounter a free cause in the series of appearances. 
but it's not absolutely impossible that an object of experience, so something that occurs in the series of appearances, might also be a free cause viewed in some different respect. And or might be the effect of a free cause. Um, right, and that's what we're giving the thesis. So like, I mean, it's, uh, we're not talking about um, some like unknowable effects of unknowable causes, right? They, I mean, like it's certainly a logical possibility that noumena cause other noumena somehow. It's right, that is, there's no contradiction in thinking that. Uh, but that has nothing to do with us. Um, it's that's an empty logical possibility. Um, so um, the what we're interested in here is the idea that something we we know as a, as an object of experience is itself can itself also be a free cause when it's looked at as a noumenon or can be or that something that we know as um an effect in the series of appearances and therefore as an effect of phenomenal causes that is phenomenal substances and it's so right so it's important to remember in this discussion what what Kant said already in the second analogy that the cause is always a substance and the effect is always a change in state of substances of a substance right um so um so like it's not it's not logically impossible we're saying that is again it's it's obviously not logically impossible that a noumenon causes another noumenon somehow, right? But like, but the question is, is it logically possible that the same thing that's an effect of a phenomenal substance in the world of appearances, and therefore, right, that means it's a phenomenal substance is not a free cause. It doesn't act spontaneously. It acts according to some uh, previous conditions that, that determined it to act at a certain time. Right? Because maybe I should stop drawing this. Because remember... So a substance, the schema of the category of substance is permanence in time, right? So a phenomenal substance is something that's permanent in time. And the effect is, so here's, an, here's two phenomenal substances. Right, so the effect is going to be a change in state of this one. So this one is going to change, and because we know um, that all states of substances are 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 degrees of something, right? So it's going to change from some degree of something to some other degree of that, right? And again, like we don't so uh, like. It's not part of transcendental philosophy to discuss what these things are, right? That's only known a posteriori. Um, but we do know a posteriori that uh, that one of these things is motion, right? Substances change their state from one state of motion to another state of motion. So, right, so this is an event. It's a change in state that happens at a certain time. Um, and it's caused by this substance, but of course, uh, it wasn't always caused by this substance or it would have already happened because this substance is permanent, 
right? So it was caused, it started being caused by this substance at a certain time. And, you know, in real life, that time is the same time that the effect started. That's what Kant says towards the end of the second analogy. But it's, you know, it's easier to think of it if we think of it as like before the effect. So, right, up here was the change in state from of this substance by which it went from not causing this effect to causing it. And right, and this is what Kant calls the, the causality of the cause, right? So this is the effect. And this is the causality. And this is the cause. And we can see that the that although the cause is a substance, the causality is an event. So the causality is in a, must be the effect of some cause. Um, and it can't be wholly the effect of this substance itself, right? Because again, then it would always have done it. So uh, at least in part, its cause must be some other substance. So therefore, this substance doesn't act freely, right? It acts by necessity. That is, it acts, um, uh, what it does is conditioned by, by previous states of other substances. But what we want to show is that it's not logically impossible that this effect at the same time be the effect of a free cause. Okay, so, uh, I mean, so like we're not giving the thesis very much, right? Because the thesis wanted to show that there certainly is a free cause, at least one. Right, like the thesis argued that not, no event would have a causal explanation unless there were at least one free cause. Um, uh, but uh, but instead, what the thesis is is going to get is only that um, it's not a contradiction that there's a free cause. Um, I mean, in so so in a sense, we're show we're showing that a free cause is possible, consistent with the um, um, well with the law of cause and effect in in the series of appearances. Um, but the sense of possible here is very weak. It's logical possibility, which really, logical possibility really, according to Kant, means the possibility of the representation, right? Like, remember, he thinks that a, a representation that contains a contradiction is formally uh, unreal. It lacks formal reality. So it's not fully a representation or something like that. Um, so um, so when we say it's logically possible, we're just saying the representation is possible. <laughs> um, um, in another sense, if by possibility you meant real possibility, that is objective possibility, um, then as Kant says, and this is on B, 586. Um. 
it has not even been our intention to prove the possibility of freedom. Right? So not only have we not proven, proved, proven, whatever, that there actually uh, is a free cause, we haven't even proved that a free cause is possible. All we've proved is that you can think a free cause without contradiction. So uh, you might think, well, that's, well, I mean, first of all, you might think, uh, um, well, that's not much. You can think anything without contradiction. <laughs> um, but uh, um, no, actually, it can be pretty hard to tell whether what you're thinking is self-consistent or not. Um, uh, but secondly, you might think, well, what good is that? Right? Because again, it doesn't tell us any, it doesn't tell me about the object. So so when I think free cause, it do, I don't know if I'm referring to anything. I mean, as I know, I'm not referring to anything, basically. Right? Like, that's why I can't even start to ask whether it's possible or actual or whatever. Um, I mean, remember, possibility and actuality are categories. Right? Or they're moments of the category of modality. And we can only use them with their with their schemata. So we know what possible means as schematized, um, as you know, um, occurring at some point in time or something like that. Right? Uh, I forget exactly what he says in the in the schematism, but it's 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 roughly speaking that right and. And, you know, we know that the result of that in the postulates is that what is possible is what is consistent with the form of um, intuition and, and of the understanding. Um, but, I mean, that's only for phenomena. What if you want to know if a certain noumenon is possible? And the answer is we don't know what we're asking. Okay, so again, you might think this is very little, um, but uh, it turns out to be all that's needed for the practical philosophy. So it actually turns out when you go to the practical philosophy that according to Kant, this is really important. And I mean, we saw roughly speaking the reason for that already in the preface, right? It's that, again, the, the point is to limit theoretical reason. So you know, say, you have no way of ruling out this case. Um, you have no way of representing it at all, basically. I mean, that is, you have a way of thinking it, but you have no way of referring to it, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so like, uh, you can't say anything about it, theoretical reason. And then meanwhile, practical reason is going to say, we must assume freedom. We're required to. And with with theoretical reason restrained, then that um, um, that practical authority can take effect. All right. So um, Okay, so again, so the outcome is that neither the thesis nor the antithesis are correct. They've misstated their claims, right? Um, the, the antithesis should have confined itself to saying a free cause can't as appear as such in the series of appearances. And the, and the thesis should have confined itself to saying there is no contradiction in, in an appearance something within the series of appearances also being a free cause or the effect of a pre free cause. Um, so if they had each stated their claims in that way, they, um, they would have both been right and there would be no contradiction between them. Okay, so...
Um, so that's what we're heading for. But I did want to say uh, something about that general difference between the mathematical and dynamical ideas. Um, right. The reason I say the mathematical and dynamical ideas. So, I mean, because first of all, Kant says that at some point, right? But like, in a sense, there's just three ideas of reason corresponding to the paralogism, the antinomy, and the ideal. But then you could also say, and Kant, I don't think ever says this in the paralogism or the ideal, but the antinomy, he talks about the subparts corresponding to the headings of the categories as each its own idea. So, right, so there's four cosmological ideas. Um, and so two of them are are mathematical and the other two are dynamical. Um, um, Wait, now my notes aren't making sense to me. Okay, I think I've rearranged them. So what I was just saying is not true. Oh no, I see what I was thinking. All right, right. So, um, so you can ask, why is there this difference between mathematical and dynamical in the case of the antinomies? when there doesn't seem to be such a difference in the case of the paralogisms or the ideal. Um, Yeah, so no, it's what, right. what I'm about to say isn't really doesn't really address that. So yeah, so what I wrote in my notes doesn't make sense. Okay, let me just talking about start talking about what I what I'm going to talk about next. So, um, and stop trying to get the transition right. So this, this is what I want to talk about. Like, um, I guess you could say, why in the case of the third antinomy, I mean, okay, it is kind of relevant. This is, why in the case of the third antinomy, um, would it be not satisfactory to dismiss both sides? And you can ask that first from a, like a practical point of view. Because, um, again, the reason, reason, <laughs> the reason, reason is really interested in this idea of freedom is because of morality. Right, like that's why this is um, not an optional topic. Um, so, uh, um, so like, let's think about what 
what practical reason needs in the way of freedom. So like on the one hand, um, freedom requires, free, freedom means freedom to act against any private interest. Um, well, yeah, I just shouldn't say, well, no, it's not really on the one hand, on the other hand. It's still one thing. What freedom actually means for the purpose of morality is freedom to act against any private interest. Because, um, you know, Kant's theory of morality is going to have to do with um, um, trying to align my will with the universal will. And... Uh, um, if I'm compelled to act according to my own private interests, that is, which comes down basically to like what causes pain and pleasure in this body, um, then that will be impossible, right? Or to put it differently and closer to what Kant actually says in this section, um, like, when I act in according to my own private will against the the universal will, so like never mind exactly what the universal will is. I, I mean, it's you know, I mean, it's an idea that Kant takes from Rousseau actually, but then like, uh, um, lifts from the realm of ordinary politics to the realm of of like metaphysical morality or something. But, you know, uh, so, but like the universal will, I mean, it's, um, it's things that a will just as such could will bef before knowing about its private interests, so to speak. That's, you know, uh that's what i'm supposed to be trying to do so when i when i act when i act against that when i do something that only i could want where but um from my particular standpoint but that if i forgot for, about my own particular standpoint i wouldn't want i couldn't want basically right so like that's when my action is blamable and but um, but the, the question is going to be, well, uh, you know, how does that make sense? Um, because uh, how else could you ever act aside from according to your private interest? Right, like uh, people who are in 100C who remember or who remember 100C, like what Locke says, when he starts discussing morality in the essay, right? He says, um, uh, it would be, I forget the word he uses, vain or something like that. Anyway, it would it would be foolish. It would be uh, not just foolish. But yeah, it would be vain for one intelligent creature to set a rule for another without effects affixing some reward or punishment as a motive, because uh, we always act to gain pleasure and avoid pain. So uh, if I tell you to do something, then um, uh, you may do it for your own reasons. In that case, you're not following my command. Or you, um, uh, if you do it because you're following my command, it must be because now somehow I've given you your own reason to follow it because of it, because it's a command, right? That is, if I attached reward and punishment. So, um, Right, so he's Kant, uh, Locke. There is basically saying, "This is what Kant is demanding is impossible. We couldn't act against our own private interests." Right. So we want what we want is to be f 
for morality from Kant's point of view is to be able to assume that we can act against our own private interest. But if the thesis is the third antinomy got this right, that is, if we're right that the reason that that the way we should understand that demand to be fulfilled is that there can be a phenomenal substance that acts spontaneously. Um, that would undermine the theoretical employment of the understanding. That's what we showed in the second analogy, right? That is, um, if um, if empirical causes could act uh, with um, without something determining them in advance, which way how to act. Um, um, then. Uh, Hume would be right. There would be no legitimate application of the concept of cause. Um, and so we would have no concept of action. Right? Like an action is a way that a substance causes an effect. So if the um, if the second analogy could be violated, that would mean that um, um, I couldn't act against my own private interest because I couldn't act at all, because nothing could act. <laughs> um, and in fact, nothing could even be represented as before anything else or after. Um, so, uh, um, so therefore, like the, um, the third, the thesis of the third antinomy really didn't deliver at all what practical reason wants. Um, Yeah, I keep worrying. I think everything I just said is right. All I'm I'm worrying over, which is stupid, is like the the neat way I was trying to frame it. Um, right. So like, that's why this this critical solution is, according to Kant, is the right thing for morality. Whereas, like, holding that the thesis was right would be the wrong thing for morality. Um, but also obviously holding that the antithesis is right would also be right and that a free cause of sensible effects is impossible is a self-contradiction and would also be bad for morality. Um, so we can't declare that either one of them is right yeah, and I guess, I mean, this is the point. Both of them, however, have said something that morality needs. The antithesis has emphasized that the causal order of nature must be complete, and that's something morality needs. Whereas the thesis has emphasized that um, a free cause is possible, and that's something that morality needs. So that's why the judge... <laughs> Um, if uh, if the judge has the interest of morality at heart, the judge is going to be happy to settle this case in this way, not in the other way, as happened to the mathematical categories. Um,
Right. On the other hand, from a theoretical point of view, um, so um, I wonder if I'm spending too much time on this. Right. So, um, you know, and I'm going to come back to this after I discuss how the how the solution is supposed to work out in detail. All right. So here's how the solution is supposed to work out. Um, so, I mean, first, like. Uh, uh, like a rough pr preview of how it's going to work out. So, I mean, we're going to say that determinism is true and nevertheless that absolute freedom is possible. Where again, by possible, we mean thinkable, not self-contradictory. So, um, but there's there's several things that are important to understand about that. So um, the first one is that um, um, the absolutely free cause, so the absolutely free cause is going to be something viewed as a noumenon. Um, now, I mean, first of all, so remember, like the way I explain the difference between a phenomenon and a noumenon. The phenomena and noumena are two different types of objects. That is, they're objects of two different types of faculties. They're not two different types of thing or being, right? They're two different ways that something can be object of a uh, faculty of, um, intellect intellection basically understand right so one way is that um, there's a discursive understanding well let me say there's an act of discursive understanding that is a concept an empirical concept Right, so here's an empirical concept. So an empirical concept is like demands that um, something affect me according to a certain rule. Um, but it doesn't say what affects me according to that rule. Right, that is, it's a it's a general representation. Anything that affects me according to that rule is going to count as the object. But the representation itself doesn't select any object. 
right? It doesn't point me towards anything that does satisfy the rule. It just says to count as object of this concept, you must satisfy this rule, right? So, um, um, therefore, I can't actually refer to an object uh, using this concept unless in, unless something comes along and affects me according to that rule. So in order to refer to the object, I also need this empirical intuition. The empirical intuition, so this is the object that is the phenomenon. A phenomenon is something that's object of this kind of faculty. And the way it's object of it is that it affects me according to the rule that's in it. And then I compare it with the rule that I have, that is my concept. Um, and if they match, <laughs> then it's my object, right? Whatever was affecting me in the right way is the, is the object I was referring to. So that's what it means to be a phenomenon. On the other hand, to be a noumenon means to be the object of a different kind of understanding, one that doesn't need to wait for its object to affect it in some way. Why? Because somehow its rule that it sets is enough to um, um, to produce something that conforms to it. Right, so just by having that rule, it already refers to something, namely the thing that that now must exist in conformity to that rule. So that's right. That's what's called an intuitive intellect or a, a intellectual intuition. So you know, here's an act of intellectual intuition. Now, um, and its object is a noumenon. Now I've drawn these at the same point, right? Like the same thing is both a phenomenon and a noumenon. Um, is that possible? Well, is it really possible? That is, um, when we think this phenomenon is the same as some noumenon, um, are we referring to something? Are we using the concept, is the concept of identity that we're using there, right? The same as means identical to. Is the concept of identity that we're using when we say this phenomenon is possibly the same as some noumenon. Is it being used to refer to anything? And the answer is no, because we, we don't know how to apply the concept of identity and difference to noumena. Right? We apply the concepts of identity and difference, as Kant says in the Amphiboly, um, to objects insofar as they are in space. If they're in the same space at the same time, then they're the same. And if they're in different spaces at the same time, they're different. But the noumenon isn't in space. So we don't know what it means for a noumenon to be the same as a phenomenon or different. Like we don't know what we're thinking when we think that. And so if you if when you ask, is this possible, do you mean like, um, is there a real possibility that I'm referring to with my thought? The answer is no. But on the other hand, if you ask, is there a contradiction? Then again, the answer is no, there's no contradiction. Right? That is, it's not part of the 
and and that's why it's important that phenomenon and noumenon are like relative names for things, right? They're being denominated by their relation to a certain faculty. Um, this this faculty here, the faculty of intellectual intuition, we don't even know how that's possible or if it's possible, but we understand the definition of it, right? It's just, it does what our understanding does, but without intuition in between. That's the definition, basically. So, um, so therefore, we understand the definition of noumenon also. And there's nothing in that definition that contradicts the definition of phenomenon. So there's no reason a phenomenon can't also be a noumenon. There's also no reason and no even understanding of how it can be. Is that... Are there questions about that? I know there's not that many people here, but the people who are here are, are among the people who are most likely to ask questions, so. Okay, so, so, so that's, so, okay, so, um, so when we say that something that's in the series of appearances might also be a noumenon, we're thinking about this picture, right? That is, we're thinking that something that's the object of our actual cognitive faculties could also be the object of a completely different kind of cognitive faculty. Um, And then, as the object of that kind of cognitive faculty, uh, it wouldn't be subject to the law of cause and effect. Um, so, I mean, we don't know how the concept of cause and effect can apply to it at all. Again, right, like cause and effect are, are categories, and that means we only know how to use them with their schematism, and the schematism has to do with, uh, like, effects succeeding causes in time. And, you know, that when we view this thing as a noumenon, time, right, space and time are, are here. Space and time are, are, are part, are the, are the form of this empirical intuition that it has in common with all other in empirical intuitions. So however this faculty represents the noumena, it doesn't represent it in time. Um, and therefore we don't know how it would represent it as cause or effect. Um, but on the other hand, cause and effect aren't limited in themselves, like, Right, it's we just can't use them without the schematism. Um, so there's no contradiction in saying that this thing is has you know has effects and is a cause, regarded as a noumenon. But and this is the important point that I've taken longer than I should have get to get to. Um, that means that. Um, when we think of it as a, as a free cause, we're not thinking of it as in time. That is, you can't you can't say, well, when does it when does it make its free action? The effect now will be in time, right? That is where, because, because we're thinking, what we're asking, of course, is not only can, can this phenomenon also be a noumenon, but can the thing that's a phenomenon and as a phenomenon has empirical causal, uh, is, is an empirical cause of empirical effects, 
can it also, regarded as a noumenon, be the cause of those same effects? Right, again, we're not, we don't care if it has noumenal effects. That's not what we're interested in, right? Because the, the effects that are important for morality are empirical effects. So what we want to know is, um, uh, can this thing that regarded as a noumenon is the cause of certain effects? As, sorry, as regarded as a phenomenon is, is the empirical cause of certain effects and therefore not their free cause because empirical causes are not free. Um, could it, when we look at it as a noumenon, turn out that it's still the cause of those effects, but now it's free. <laughs> From that point of view, it's free, right? Okay. And again, the answer, the solution is going to be yes. That's That's yes in the sense that there's no contradiction in that. But then you have to remember that when you think of it as, as a noumenon, as causing those empirical effects, you're thinking of the effects being in time, but you're not thinking of the cause acting in time. So this the picture I drew before, right? An empirical substance, I wonder if my other marker is better than this marker. An empirical substance is something permanent in time, right? So it exists at all these times. Um, but um, its effect happens at some time rather than another time. And that must be because it acted at a certain time and not before. So although the substance was always here, it didn't act until now. So its causality was at this time here and its effect was at this time here. So, um, um, If you uh, sorry, but if you so if you if now we say, but this same thing viewed as a noumenon is the free cause of that effect, we can't ask viewed as a noumenon when. Right, that is, we still know when the effect happened, but we can't ask when does it act, and we can't say why didn't it act until now because it didn't act at a time at all. Right, because time is a form of inner sense and it only applies to phenomena, not to noumena. So, um, So there's two, so we're, what we're saying now basically is we're imagining that this same thing um, is, an, well, there's no way to draw this and there shouldn't be a way to draw it. That's, you know, I mean, again, like according to Kant, space is the way we apply the concept of identity and difference. And this whiteboard is a space, right? And that is, and therefore it's composed of spaces. <laughs> right? So like, uh, um, so therefore it's impossible for me to draw exactly what I'm trying to draw, namely something that we're guarding as the same, but not because it's in the same place. <laughs> Um, but, you know, so there's no way to really draw it, but let me, or any way to draw it is going to be misleading. It's worse than that there's no way to really draw it. Any way I draw it is going to be misleading. But you can say something like, you know, here's from the point of, from the point of view of this as a phenomenon, it's a substance that's permanent in time and it acts 
on this other substance to cause this effect. And so it acts at this time. The reason I'm drawing little squiggly lines here is because I'm thinking of both the cause and the effect as continuous. But I mean, maybe it's just better to think of it like this. This is the effect, a change of state from one state to another. It was caused by a change of state in this substance at an earlier time. But this very substance here, I'm trying to appear to the other substance. This very substance here, we're saying also, viewed as a noumenon, is the free cause of this effect. But now there's no longer a question of when it acted. Um, And I think I want to want to say one other thing about this, which is that so there's a passage in here that's um one of the I find one of the most difficult. Well, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say most it's not difficult in the sense that it's really hard to understand. It's difficult in the sense that it seems to say the opposite of what I think Kant means. <laughs> so it's difficult for me, right? <laughs> um, right? There's a there's a point where Kant says and um Did I not write down where this was? I was like, didn't want to find it. <laughs> but there's a point where Kant says, you know, but phenomena are only representations and they must have a transcendental object as their as their ground, right? Um, which is making it sound like noumena are a kind of thing that has to be behind the phenomena. Um and then the phenomena have phenomena have to be like the way they appear to us or something like that. Um, I mean, that picture is first of all is not consistent not only with what Kant says in more official places like phenomena and noumena, but with other places things he says in the solution to the third antinomy. Right, like when he keeps saying that, you know, um, we don't know whether such a faculty is possible and stuff like that, right? Um, but, um, but, so, but I think, you know, what's important is that he says, when he says it has to have a transcendental object as its foundation. So a transcendental object is not the same thing as a noumenon. A transcendental object and this is something like, as I said, in the A edition version of a deduction, there's a lot of stuff about the transcendental object equals X, which got erased from the B edition, but it still survives in certain other places that weren't revised, like here, right? So they're, like the, the difference between the A edition and the B edition go only up to the paralogisms and then they stop. I mean, Kant says, because I didn't need to make any changes after that, but I think it's really because he just didn't get to it. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, because there aren't even minor changes, right? It's just like, he just like, you know, kept the old text. So, um, so like maybe if he had gotten to revising this part, he also would have changed that terminology of transcendental object. I think he he felt that that was misleading, right? But I think, you know, when you talk about the transcendental object, what you mean is the object in abstraction from all the predicates that we attach to it, <laughs> just as object. And it's true, like the... Um, when I say that something is a phenomenon, 
I'm saying that um, um, it is the object of this representation, <laughs> this empirical representation. And what is it? Well, the object, right? But um, everything about the object is contained in the representation, right? So like, I, I think even though, like, I, I know the way he puts it is difficult for my interpretation and maybe it's just a sign that I'm wrong, but, but, but I think that like what it, when he says that phenomena are merely representations, they must be based on a transcendental object. He, he, he just means that like everything about the phenomenon is contained in my representation. But if I ask like, what is it that I'm representing that way? The answer is the transcendental object equals X. <laughs> And why is that relevant here? Well, because that's the thing that it's not logically impossible could also be a noumenon. You know, when I say that's the thing, right? It's not a thing. I'm not like I've taken reality was part of my representation of it. <laughs> but it's um, but when I say like the same thing could also be a noumenon, what I mean, of course, is like it wouldn't still be red and heavy and toxic <laughs> as a noumenon, <laughs> but it would be the same thing that's red and heavy and toxic and that's the transcendental object. So it's really like, it's not about a kind of, it's it's not a thing, it's an object. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's the, it, and it's the object in abstraction from everything that I'm attributing to it. So like the way I can regard it as possibly a pneuma is to take away everything I attribute to it and then imagine it having some other, but not imagine really, right? Then conceive of it as having some other properties in some way I don't understand. <laughs> All right. Um, That was all supposed to be the preview of how the solution is going to work. I got bagged, bogged down in all kinds of stuff. Uh, but let me see what I want to say about the, the details of how it works. Right, so, I mean, it starts by saying um It starts by saying that reason, and actually, let me let me read this. It's on B575. And it's on page 472 in Kemp Smith. Um, no, wait, that's not the part I wanted to read first.
Oh yeah, here it is. So it's it is it's still on the same page. Five B five seventy five on page four seventy two. He says that reason is a faculty, the action of which cannot be ascribed to the receptivity of sensibility. Well, no, I guess I should start up here. He is thus to himself, that is man, is thus to himself, on the one hand, phenomenon, and on the other hand, in respect of certain faculties, the action of which cannot be ascribed to the receptivity of sensibility, a purely intelligible object. Um, and those faculties are um, understanding and reason, but then he says, especially reason. Um, so, I mean, first of all, like when we say that they're not, um, they can't be represented, they can't, uh, the action cannot be ascribed to the receptivity of sensibility. Um, Every effect in inner sense that we attribute to reason, right? So like if I actually draw a valid conclusion or if I actually decide what to do, um, we attribute those to reason. I guess even if it's not a valid conclusion, we attribute it to reason, right? So if like the every effect we attribute to reason is subject to the law of cause and effect in appearances. So um, that means that um, all those effects, well, actually, so it's, it's subject to the, first of all, to the law of substance, and second of all, to the law of cause and effect, right? So that means that, first of all, those effects are changes in the state of a substance. And substances are only given in outer sense. So those effects are changed in the state of a body. And they're subject to the law of cause and effect in general. So there are changes in state of a body, and therefore they must be in part due to other bodies acting on it. Um, and um, like, when you put together the action of all the bodies, I guess this is getting to the third analogy, you know, when you put together the actions of all the bodies, you have to get just those effects and not anything else, right? So they're completely determined by um, sensible, that is empirical causes. So what does it mean to say the action can't be ascribed to the re receptivity of sensitivity? I think, um, I mean, it doesn't mean look inside yourself and you'll find this faculty that's free. Because first of all, you won't, because that would violate the second analogy. <laughs> look inside yourself or outside yourself. You're only going to find uh, states of, of substances, that is, of things that are permanent in time, that are that fall into the causal order of nature. Um, but second of all, um, that can't be what he means because that's not the conclusion, right? The conclusion is we haven't even shown that freedom is possible. So when we say that that we find in ourselves a faculty that's not um, can't be attributed to the receptivity of sensitivity, we don't mean we look inside and find a supernatural faculty. So, I mean, what does it mean? Um, it means that uh, connections are not given uh, in intuition. 
Right. So like the, the, the thing that Hume says and that Kant agrees with against Locke, where Locke says that sometimes um, different sensations basically are such that we see a necessary connection. We see a necessary connection between them, right? That like somehow receptivity is able to receive that necessity that if we have one, we have to have the other. And Kant says in agreement with Hume and Berkeley that that's impossible. Um, that, uh, um, necessity means conformity to a rule and a rule isn't something we can receive. A rule is something we can demand. <laughs> We can propose, right? So a faculty of rules is an active faculty. It's not a faculty of receptivity. And in the case of reason, and this is why he says it's especially too with respect to reason, in the case of reason, it proposes rules. So the understanding proposes that the acts of the understanding are empirical concepts. Right. Remember, I keep saying every actual concept is an empirical concept. Pure concepts like the categories are like part of the capacity of forming empirical concepts. So the acts of, of our understanding are empirical concepts. That means that um, we demand that experience conform to a certain rule because we've already experienced it conforming to that rule, right? And that's the mysterious thing that the imagination is able to do. Um, right, is able to arrange our sensations in such a way that we can learn the rule from them. But, um, but reason in its practical employment, and I think that's what Kant is, is, is talking about here, right? Because that's what he goes on to talk about in the next paragraph. Reason in its practical employment sets rules that we haven't experienced being followed. Right? That is, it says, this is what ought to happen. And if you say, but that doesn't happen, it says, doesn't matter. That's what ought to happen. <laughs> so like, that's why it's especially reason, but it's reason and understanding really, right? That is, they're both active faculties that propose rules and therefore they're both can't be accounted for by, by sensitivity. So if we were able to think of ourselves purely as an understanding or reason and ask, okay, what kind of object is that? We would reach the conclusion, it's a noumenon. Because we would have to abstract from all the sensible things we know about what really goes on in our mind. So it would be left only with this purely active faculty. And basically that's the paralogisms, <laughs> right? That is when we do that from a theoretical point of view, we get the paralogisms. So, um, so it's a mistake. So like, um, So we, when, when he says, going back to this, I'm obviously not going to get very far here, but well, I think I've said the most important things.
we say man is thus to himself on the one hand phenomenon and on the other hand in respect of certain faculties the action of which cannot be ascribed to the receptivity of sensibility a purely intelligible object you know what it what it means is what that means from a theoretical point of view is as i said if we could make ourselves an object at all that way it would have to be a purely intelligible object but in fact we can't determine ourselves as an object that way right we only observe ourselves by means of inner sense so although we so to speak are these active faculties we don't um what we know is only their effects <laughs> And like everything is going to turn on, and of course, this is something that's like exactly how this works is beyond the scope of this course because it has to do with the practical philosophy, right? But everything is going to turn on the idea that from a practical point of view, it's different. Um, that, um, um, the will is its own object as such, on sich, right? That is in itself, right? So the will is, now what kind of objects does the will have? The objects of the will are ends, things it's acting for. And uh, so, right, so in the practical philosophy, Kant will say the will is an end in itself. Um, so like from a practical point of view, we are noumena basically. Um, okay. I'm sure that was not very satisfactory, but I want to, <laughs> and, and I haven't really got to say what I, what I hope to investigate, like why this difference between the mathematical and the dynamical categories occurs here and not in the paralogisms and the idea all. But I think rather than say anything about that, I want to emphasize some things about how this solution works out. I mean, I've said most of them already, but it's important to emphasize them. So like, um, uh, we leave room for freedom, but not for any exceptions to the law of cause and effect. So Kant says, no, I don't have time to read this in the book, but I'll just read it from my notes. If we could exhaustively investigate all the appearances of men's wills, there would not be found, oh, I didn't write the whole quote. <laughs> there would not be found a single human action. And then he goes on to say that, you know, they could all be determined by their previous causes, right? And he gives an example of someone who tells a lie. And if we wanted to account for that, we could totally account for it in terms of their education and their temperament and so forth. So that from a theoretical point of view, if we knew everything about their, the, um, their empirical character, so their empirical character is their permanent nature. That is the nature of the substance that they are. And again, that's a body, right? So if we knew everything about their body, and probably especially about their brain, although Kant actually argues against the thesis that thinking happens only in the brain. But, you know, in any case, if we knew everything about their body, uh, we would know what, and, and of course, how other bodies affect it, we would know what they were going to do. So this kind of transcendental freedom does not generate any exceptions to that. Um, and second of all, again, if you ask, like, okay, well, then how can it be that we're saying that this free cause could have acted otherwise? So, you know, like, here's the law of cause and effect. And in this series, we get to this event. 
which you know is the is the effect of a certain phenomenal substance that is a certain body effect of its causality that happened at this time and this causality couldn't have not happened at that time because it was previously i mean it's i, I should its causality is also one of these effects right so its causality was determined by another one which was determined by another one and you know like um so um and in particular is determined by ones that happened before i was born now like before i was born doesn't mean this substance didn't exist, but because substance is preserved, right? But, you know, like what that means is that the pieces I was made out of already existed. <laughs> At some point I was born. At some time before I was born, it was already determined that I was gonna do this. Now, I'm out of time. But I'll just say, so you might ask, when could I possibly have freely decided to do it? But again, the answer is no time. <laughs> there is no time at which I decided. So what happened? Well, um, the appearance of this thing is a substance that is, it's some permanent character. That's what Kant calls my empirical character. Um, regarded as noumenon, I also regard this as the immediate cause of every effect of this empirical character. So like the empirical character doesn't have effects all on its own, right? It's like other things are always affecting it, but part of its effect is due to its own character and the other part is due to the way other things are affecting it, right? So the part that's due to its own character is the part that we regard this qua noumenon as free cause of. So now when you say this noumenon could have caused a different effect here, what you mean is, as, as Kant says at one point, if the intelligible character had been different, the empirical character would have been different. That is, this would have been a different substance. And because of the third analogy, we know that means that all the other substances would have been different. And they would always have been different. They would always have been different because of the way this noumenon decides, but it's so to speak already decided before time, <laughs> right? Um, so because it decided to tell this lie, that's why this substance is the way it is. And that can only be true if all the other substances are the way they are. But if it could have not decided to tell this lie, in that case, this substance would have been different and all the other substances would have been different. That's what's logically possible. Um, okay, there's obviously more to say about that, but I've gone four minutes over and I have to get ready for my other class, so. <laughs> I will see you next week. And uh, at this point, I mean, I'm guessing we're still going to be on Zoom. We have to see what happens, but I don't know. Maybe the strike will roll on to another campus. <laughs> but if not, anyway, stay tuned for, for news about that. Okay, see you then. Bye. Thank you.